Welcome to the fifth in our lesson series on the engineering design process. Today we're going to be talking about specifying requirements and prototyping. I'm Denny Davis. I, it's my pleasure to discuss this topic with you. So let's get started. We're going to be talking about requirements and prototyping, which occurs in the third phase of the engineering design process. Recall that we have already talked about needs. We have come up with a design concept. So our functional needs, technical needs, resource needs, human needs, now focused around this concept that we're using to create the robot we desire will lead to engineering requirements. Our prototyping, which is actually a way of modeling the solution that we're envisioning, it, we're going to talk about what kind of things we should be prototyping, ways we can use to prototype, and the outcomes that we would hope to achieve from this prototyping. We see that the role of prototyping in design is really the role of taking us from one milestone to another. We have in hand a design concept. We're hoping to have a proven prototype. So Prototyping is a way of getting us from this concept to having a proven concept that shows itself to be effective through the use of prototypes. As a design concept, we have conceptualized the systems that a robot will have that give us our desired functionality. We've defined the ways in which these actions or functions will occur. Our engineering requirements then are a quantification of these actions, getting specific on what actions are required to meet the needs. We also find that we're going to need to specify how these actions are coordinated, and how different systems interact. So again, we're quantifying or making very specific in engineering requirements. Prototyping is actually in modeling or analyzing the robot features in order to see that we are achieving those requirements. We determine how the robot is going to perform, see if it meets the requirements that we have defined. Assuming that we're successful, we will have this verified prototype verified that it meets the requirements. We also will gain knowledge about how the performance is going to be affected as we vary different conditions on our robot. So this kind of information is going to be very useful to us as we move forward in our design process. Now what is an engineering requirement? Remember we had user needs. Take, for example, this simple system of positioning or repositioning a bottle. We have needs that are perceived by the stakeholders, what it should do, how it should do it. These are typically non-technical. They're approximate in nature. An engineering requirement is going to be something that is a clear specification that is needed in order to achieve the performance that we desire. It's often technical and measurable. It is based on our conceptual design. So the concept we had in mind on how we're going to achieve the performance puts constraints on us. So that we're now working with that concept in developing measurable technical requirements for that concept to meet the requirements. For example, for this simple 
follow the positioning position. We may have had needs stated very simply as lift the bottle, it's full, gently place the bottle so it's not damaged, be able to relocate it from one po position to another in three seconds. An engineering requirement, on the other hand, gets specific. We be, must be able to lift a bottle that's 1.2 pounds, lift it 6 inches off the table, hold it in that lifted position for 10 seconds. Gently placing it now is defined in terms of lowering it a certain distance, and the velocity of approach being below some specified level so we don't damage the bottle when we place it. Relocation, again, we need to specify that this lifting, this turning, this placing must be accomplished in a certain period of time. So you notice that the requirements are much more specific. They're based on the concept, the way in which we're going to accomplish what this bottle repositioning system is to do. Let's define requirements for the ring collection. We've talked about ring collection, handling, scoring in previous lessons. So how would we define the requirements for the ring collection part of this? Remember that our system was one that used rotating fingers Fingers on a shaft that rotates, grabs the ring, and pulls it into the scoop. So the user need simply stated is collect one ring in two seconds, and it needs to be of the alliance color. It corresponds to our team. We then write entering requirements. First of all, something about rotating the fingers pulling in the scoop and accomplishing this in one second. So we've specified the time and that we're going to accomplish this task by engaging the ring and pulling it into the scoop. The second requirement is we need to check this ring, make sure that it's in the scoop and it's of the proper color. And then if it meets these requirements, we send a signal to the operator or perhaps uh, part of a program that it's ready and we can move on to the next step. If it's not OK, then we immediately reverse the rotating fingers to check the ring. So see, we've added a lot of detail based upon the concept of how we're going to collect it. And we've defined very specifically what must be accomplished in what period of time. Now for the scoop and ring positioning, that's getting the scoop with the ring in a position for scoring, we can define some additional requirements. The user need in this case is probably something like transport the scoop and the ring into a position that's ready for scoring and do this within two seconds. The first engineering requirement deals with extending the slider. The scoop must move along the slider to the end of the slider and the incline is adjusted as necessary. In this case, we're allocating one and a half seconds for that part of the uh, performance that we expect. One and a half seconds to accomplish that. Secondly, we need to check for readiness to score. Is the scoop in the right position relative to the peg? So we need to detect the presence of a peg. And then, if it's ready, send a signal for the next step in this uh, scoring process. For ring scoring itself, we would probably have a user need to like, drop a ring on a peg in one second. 
We want to allocate one second for this scoring action. So perhaps we can say as an enduring requirement that we need to score the ring on the peg in one second, which requires rotating the scoop. In this case, I've said nine degrees. It could be some other angle. And then use the rotating fingers to push the ring from the scoop. It pushes it and it goes on to the peg. Then we need to retract the slider and scoop. Get it ready for the next attempt at collecting rings. So we rotate the scoop counterclockwise. We retract the slider and scoop. And we reset the incline of the slider. Now, I didn't allocate any time for this because this could be accomplished as a robot is moving across the field going to collect the next ring. So again, note that we had one second to accomplish all of this. We've allocated the time. We've identified the actions required to meet that need. Let's think for a moment about these requirements. How did we define them? First of all, we had to think through the details of how we would implement this concept. What specific actions were required with this concept to achieve what was necessary? Sometimes we had series, sometimes we had concurrent actions. We need to identify which actions fall into these two categories. Then we had to quantify the motions, the timing, signals. So there are a number of things we need to do in defining requirements. Now, let's think for a moment. What are some of the benefits of going through this very rigorous process? of defining requirements. First of all, it focuses our attention on the critical functions or features that are necessary for this scoring, in this case, to be successful. It helps us identify where we're going to need motors and servos. In other words, what parts need to be moved and perhaps how much power is going to be assumed for those different uh, requirements. We also see where sensors are going to be needed because in order to achieve the actions within the limited time, we can speed that by having appropriate sensors. We see how much time is available for each step. Now, something we often don't think about one of the benefits is stimulating communication among the members of our team. Different members might be involved in the mechanisms, some in the power system, some in sensors, some in software. Everyone needs to be involved in this discussion so that they can say that what we're requiring is feasible. Can the sensing be done? Can we uh, accomplish these movements in the time allocated? So this generates communication among our team members to achieve success in the future. Now let's think about prototypes. What is a prototype? Assuming that we have these requirements now, prototypes again are gonna be useful to us to see whether or not we can meet these requirements. Prototype is simply a first approximation, something that is of the general type. It's simple. It's an experimental model so that we can actually do some testing with it. And hopefully it's time saving, cost saving. We don't build the entire robot before we find out if something works. So prototype is very important. Well, we need to think of it as being simple and uh, focused on achieving the uh, experimental conditions, determining experimentally whether things are going to work as we had hoped. Some examples are shown here. 
could be a Lego model to see how things function. It could be a CAD model which shows relative positioning, sizing, interactions. It could be a physical model made out of wood, cardboard, uh, other materials available. It could be something like a clay model or that helps to visualize. So prototypes can come in many different forms, but we need to choose the prototype based on what we're attempting to do. So what are the reasons for prototyping? Let's keep in mind that our big goal is to verify that performance and features meet the requirements. So let's look at some different types of requirements. Let's say that a requirement has to do with specified positioning. What questions can we answer with this kind of a, a question, uh, with this kind of requirement? We can see how accurately and repeatedly we can achieve this positioning, how much time it takes, how does it affect weight balance. If we have something that is a requirement that specifies effort or energy input, you know, what are maximum forces expected? what power is required, and the worst case conditions. If a requirement deals with being able to sense something, it can help us, prototyping can help us determine how likely that we get the true measurement or accurate information. Also can help us see how much time is required. Sometimes sensing requires a significant amount of time and interpretation. When we have requirements about human factors, we need prototypes that help us see how does the operator interact with the robot? Or how do people observing view or judge the robot? So different kinds of prototypes would be necessary for answering these types of questions. Let's look at some alternatives, different ways we can prototype. How do you choose the method? Now, let's look at some possible types of prototypes. It could be physical models, could be a drawing, hand drawing, could be a CAD drawing, could be a math model or simulation, could be a storyboard. <clears throat> we choose the proper prototype by asking ourselves Know, what would it cost us in terms of time and materials if we use this type of prototype? How well does this help us to evaluate whatever the requirements are? How flexible is it in terms of giving us the ability to explore performance if we vary conditions, vary parameters? So different types of uh, prototypes give us different abilities here. Physical model, from that we can see visual features, we can get the feel for it, how it interacts, how it moves, but they're often very difficult to change parameters, to change different conditions. You have to rebuild it and change a major number of elements in a physical model to give you the ability to check other conditions. Manual drawing, you can look at visual features, dimensions, sketch them out and measure them. But they're also somewhat limited in terms of varying parameters. You have to draw, draw it again. So there may be some ability to do parametric studies. CAD gives us, again, chances to look at visual features, actions, and determine forces. It has some ability to change parameters as we move parts around or uh, make certain variations. Math models give us the greatest ability to vary parameters. With these models, we can predict motion, speed, forces, torques, power requirements. Uh, a lot of things are quantifiable. We can uh, study them with math, math models or simulations. Storyboarding or just drawing visuals at different steps in time can give us the ability to visualize change, sequencing of steps. Uh, if we're going to look at parametric variations, we have to develop a different storyboard 
and make adjustments so they're not very easily used for parametric studies. So again, depending upon how, what, we're, what we need to um, observe, how much we need to vary, different types of these uh, prototypes might be better than others. So we need to think carefully about the best type before we commit ourselves. Okay, let's take an example here. Let's uh, plan for prototyping. How would we develop a plan? First of all, identify the system. So perhaps it's a ring handling system. We need to uh, take the requirements that we select that we're going to be studying and uh, the prototyping process needs to fit that. So let's look at for uh, this ring handling system some example requirements. The things that we might need to study in detail would be the collection of ring in two seconds cannot be accomplished. Can we position the scoop in two seconds? Can we score the ring in one second? For collecting the ring in two seconds, a prototype probably needs to be physical because the collection action uh, requires uh, the interaction of those fingers with the ring and it could be difficult to study without physical models. We can do this in a simple way by taking a stationary drill that's powering a shaft with fingers on it and the scoop. We can adjust the angle of the scoop. We can introduce rings into the uh, range of those fingers and see how much time it takes to collect those rings. Well, that's a, a possible plan if we're attempting to measure the, whether we can collect rings in two seconds. What about positioning? In this case, uh, the actual interaction of components is not so difficult to understand. What we're really trying to get at here is uh, the timing and the actions necessary to accomplish this physical positioning of the scoop. So with a math model, given certain slider dimensions, we can calculate the slope and how much it must extend from a particular robot position to reach the scoring position. So we can usually calculate that using trigonometry. From this, we can also calculate string force and distance and length of string needs to be collected in order to extend the slider, the required distance. Calculate the force and distance to move the scoop to the end of the slider. You can also calculate force and the angle adjustment required to um, get that slider at the right incline angle. And so all of these uh, things can be determined mathematically without actually having to build a physical model. Scoring, again, is going to be uh, very difficult to analyze unless we have a physical model with rings moving around those uh, pegs. So we can measure the ring scoring success as we tip a scoop and reverse the fingers to move the ring out of the scoop. So again, notice a plan for prototyping for this system might require physical models, math models, and we can answer critical questions as to whether or not this concept can achieve scoring in the two seconds plus two plus one as indicated here. Now, how do we get the most out of prototyping? Now, if you take an example from industry, you'll find that people are really good at this. They use what they call lean product development. Or sometimes they call it set-based concurrent engineering. This is where you actually prototype in order to build your knowledge not just find out if it works, but to build your knowledge so you can make future design decisions that come up. 
an example that we had on our team a few years ago was that uh, as a senior project, I worked with Knut Peterson to develop a simulation of robot turn dynamics for the particular robot that we had for that season. As it turned out, <clears throat> when we got to the world competition, the field was placed on a carpet which gave a different driving resistance than was used throughout the entire season. And so with this model, Knut was able to quickly make adjustments in the programming so that our turning was made accurate on this different surface condition, which gave us an incredible advantage in the competitions uh, for that particular world championship. So by having this information from <clears throat> modeling the system dynamics, we were able to make future design decisions very quickly. Another example that we might think about for this ring system that we're talking about is analyzing the scoring by using this physical model, varying the angle of the uh, scoop when it's tipped, its position relative to the peg, gathering data for a variety of different conditions will then prepare us so that as conditions change in the future, we have the data to support decisions we need to make so that our scoring is done accurately and quickly, even under uh, perhaps unexpected conditions. So we gather this data on how it works as we vary conditions. And remember, document. Document your prototyping and the interpretations. Begin at your documenting the system that is being prototyped, requirements and questions that you are attempting to answer. Describe your prototype clearly with pictures, drawings. Describe your testing procedure, what steps you're taking, what variations, what measurements are to be made, and the results so that you have the raw data, the observations collected, and then finally, the interpretations based on the data you collected. Perhaps you graph it, you explain it, you show how it affects design decisions. So documenting your prototyping is very important and requires you capture and interpret information well. All right, summary then over what we talked about today. For requirements, we want to, this requires careful analysis of actions. It will reveal what's essential in terms of sequencing, the actions, communications. It will lead to quantified um, timing, positioning, sensing, signaling that um, is required to make the performance. And we need to document these requirements uh, with visuals that help us understand them carefully in the future. Prototyping requires that we focus prototyping on the features or functions that have these very important engineering requirements. We don't model the entire robot. We model only what will give us information about these features and functions. We select the type of prototype that gives us economy of time and materials, gives us accuracy, gives us flexibility to design. And then we design the testing to yield the useful data, the data that we need and we interpret the results, both for our immediate needs, but also interpret for how it can be used later if uh, conditions change. Again, we need to document the prototype, the variables, results, interpretations. So our requirements guide us in terms of the prototyping 
and we get the most out of our prototyping by proper communication and testing. So, today we discussed how we specify entering requirements, how we would select proper prototypes and how they might be useful. Notice that uh, we're not done with prototyping. In the next lesson, we're going to continue prototyping, but go into detail on some of the prototyping that might be useful to our teams with some uh, detailed examples and see how this leads to details for our solution. So we'll talk about prototyping and detailing the solution in our next lesson. Thank you for staying with us. Again, I uh, appreciate this opportunity to work with Robraders and XBots and putting these lessons together. We look forward to seeing you again next time. And we again thank FIRST for inspiring us in robotics, which gives us sporting type events for the mind. We'll see you next time.